Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Fellowship Friday for the Church of the Eternally Secure. I want to welcome you, especially if uh, you happen to stumble across this video. Uh, if you're not familiar with what we do, uh, I'm glad you are here and maybe you'll enjoy it and want to join us all the time. We have three live broadcasts a week, a Sunday church service at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, a Wednesday night Bible study that starts 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time, and this Friday night fellowship program it starts at 9.30 Eastern. So uh, welcome to you, and also welcome to everybody in the chat room, to all the regular members of the congregation. Welcome back. And so uh, rather than uh, any small talk first, we'll go ahead and get started with some introductions first. Um, so far we have here joining me on the, the panel, um, uh, I'm gonna go in, have you introduce yourself as I see you from left to right. It may be different the way you're seeing it, but first is uh, uh, Sister Paula, Bible literalist, uh, tell people who you are on YouTube in case someone doesn't know you. Well, I am Bible literalist. That's what I do at my channel. Um, got almost 500 videos now. So there got to be something of interest there for everybody. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I would say that uh, there's a lot of interest there. Uh, if someone actually really is seriously interested in the Bible. I agree. Yeah. You're gonna, you're gonna, that's a good place to go to get some real deep, deep uh, study. Not superficial, very deep, and uh, a, lot of, yep. a lot of good uh, teaching there. Uh, next we have, uh, as I see it, is uh, your brother Cripps. Hi guys, uh, my name is Jason Cripps, and I'm part of a channel called True Story Live, and we broadcast on Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm also on Brother Luke's broadcast on Wednesday. And on Talking Doctrine uh, Mondays for Mondays Milk, and uh, we also occasionally on uh, TSL we do uh, testimonies when someone comes along and wants to do that, and that's something that I really really enjoy doing. And then uh, when I can make it, I'm um, part of this program as well of the fellowship, which I've been enjoying that and having a good time with that. So I'm glad to be here. And hello to the chat. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Um, I've um uh, I, I've done a lot of interviews, probably about 20 interviews of people in the congregation. And I hope you'll watch those interviews. But um, now I've kind of just conceded the, the, that part of the, the, or what we do over to Brother Cripps. He does a very good job doing these testimonies. Oh. So if you want to have a testimony or an interview, then uh, contact any of us. But I'll, we'll refer you over to Brother Cripps for that. Well, thank you. The, the, the one exception is that I would love to do an actual interview with Sister Lisa. Uh, yeah. Uh, I've, I've done one, one with uh, also with uh, uh, Sister Paula here already, uh, but and, and Brother Cripps and Matthias and many others. Mm -hmm. But Lisa, I, if you uh, can, uh, we can schedule it. I'd like to take an hour and a half or two hours to and go from your birth to your present time so everybody can really get to know you better. Um, all right, and so that gets us to Sister Lisa. Um, for the Most High Jesus, uh, we'll tell the, pe the viewers uh, what your channel is all about. Yeah, hi. Um, hi, everyone. Blessings in Jesus' name. Thank you again, Brother Luke, for having me. Uh, my channel is primarily just me talking about things that I perceive and see that are incorrect, um, biblical misnomers, things we've been misled by, sometimes albeit well-meaning people that are sincere but sincerely wrong, things that we've came to believe as truth, uh, mostly against false doctrine um, that would lead the body of Christ astray and cause people to become shipwrecked. And I try to help people see through that by just telling them the plain, simple sense of scripture to keep them rooted and grounded firmly in Christ so they can rest assured. And all the promises that we have in King Jesus are true. They are for today. And that we're just supposed to rest in his blessed assurance so we can be at peace and live this life under the power of God and the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, uh, if you will uh, uh, listen to Sister Lisa's videos, I'm sure you know not only 
be comforted and and uh, learn, but probably get quite fired up. She'll probably stir you up your passion for Jesus. Uh, and uh, we have talk and doctrine, uh, but also uh, we have uh, Sister Paula V. I think is here. If you are, you want you want to say hi to everybody. She might not be ready yet. Yeah. Okay. Maybe she's not then. All right then. We'll go ahead and get started then. And me, I'm uh, Brother Luke. Uh, uh, my channel, Sin City Preacher. Um, for when I started the channel about eleven years ago, and to present time, I, my primary mission is to tell people about the the great news that salvation is a free gift, and it comes with a guarantee of eternal life. Mm. Uh, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Uh, everything else in the Bible pales in comparison to this one thing. We need to know who he is and how do you get saved. Mm -hmm. um, now, I do have uh, a lot of other theology on my uh, channel, so it, it, I think it can serve as a good resource for you. I have over 60 playlists on a really wide range of theological subjects, so go look through the playlists and uh, tell me what you think. Uh, all right, uh, that's it for the introductions, and uh, this is Fellowship Friday, so we want to have fellowship, but one of the things I'm trying to accomplish last week and this week is uh, get through this list of what we are, I'm calling truisms. We're about halfway through the list, and I've started a new play playlist called Truisms, so uh, you'll be able to uh, uh, access the complete list uh, on those videos. Um, so uh, I've already posted the first one tonight, and, and, and it's one that I heard recently from Sister Renee. She was in a pharmacy talking to somebody about Jesus and he was a believer and he got, he says, talking about like changing your life in order to get saved or something. And he said, you, you don't clean a fish before you catch it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, okay, uh, whoever wants to respond to that first, you don't clean a fish before you catch it. How does that relate to this uh, salvation? Mm. I, I think it's a good way to say that you don't clean yourself up before you can be saved. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's a, that's it's a, that's what we're saying is that the these truisms. Um, it should be something that is uh, only a few words, but has a profound truth about Jesus or the gospel, and uh, and it's uh, it can make people get it. A lot of people, when we try to explain these truths to people uh, in our own words, sometimes it gets a little awkward and clumsy, and they don't seem to comprehend it. So I'm hoping everybody will learn these truisms and you know have, use them, popularize them. Uh, uh, let's say well, all Sister Paula V. I see is with us now. So you want to say hi to everybody, and then also respond to this first truism we're talking about. Oh, uh, you don't clean the fish yet. before you catch it. She's not oh. quite here yet. I was just setting it up. Sorry. Oh, okay. You tricked me. <laughs> okay. I'll I'll go. I'll, yeah, I'll go. go. Um, yeah, the, I I love this one because it's so true. Because um, you know, as uh, Lisa was saying, what her the, one of the purposes of her channel uh, was indeed um, uh, setting right what what went wrong or what people are saying. I'm uh, paraphrasing her, but um, it's also what uh, Renee does. You know, the untwisting of scripture. And uh, a lot of people, a lot of a lot of pastors out there are acting like we clean ourselves up first and then come to God, which means change our lifestyle rather than it being uh, a change of mind that, that makes you saved. Um, it's a change of lifestyle uh, as if some, that's that's the way we have to come uh, come to God. And it's just not it's not backed by Scripture. It's their misinterpretation of Scripture. And so I love the saying. I think it's I think it's right on. It's it, you know it's right up my alley. It's um, it's uh, we 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 come to Christ how we are, and then His Holy Spirit is the one that makes the changes. His His Holy Spirit is the one that works in us and through us to do uh, what is His uh, desire for our lives. Um, so we're not cleaning ourselves up first and 
and then coming to him, this look like we're all clean. In fact, we don't have the ability to clean ourselves up at all. Um, it's only by the changes he makes in us that that uh, has any lasting good, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, amen. Uh, you know, there, the verses that we were talking about last week, many of them were also related to the idea of no works for salvation. But this one zeroes in on a particular aspect of it, and that is, uh, our, 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 is, this, is a changed life a prerequisite? to get saved. Right. And uh, uh, I, in my statement of faith that I put on every one of my videos in the, in the description box, part of it says that uh, works are not required to get saved, works are not required to keep our salvation, and works are not required to prove we're truly saved. Mm. Um, so, uh, but many people do think that, uh, well, I, I can't, Jesus would never accept me. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm too bad or something, or I, uh, I'll improve my life or something first. Sure. If that's what they're waiting for, the day will never come that they can first make themselves acceptable to God before they, they come to him. Uh, and if they could do that, why would they need Jesus in the first place? If that was possible to do it on your own. Yeah. Uh, Sister Lisa, what, what do you say? Yeah, amen, brother. I absolutely agree. Um, if you look in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, it says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Mm. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Now, this is a prophecy. It says, shall be. It hadn't happened yet. And then we see once Jesus has gone to the cross and been crucified and and buried and resurrected on the third day the declaration is now something different it has been done it's in the past yeah because when he was buried the bible says we were buried with him in the grave and then when he was raised we were raised with him mm. that's the symbolism from water baptism by the way we are identifying with the death burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and we're declaring to the world that he is our savior that he's my savior mm. it's a testimony to the world of who we identify with Ooh. and we're saying we're in recognition of what great thing Jesus accomplished in his death burial and resurrection and don't ever forget ascension because when he was raised and the women came to him he said touch me don't touch me handle me yet he said, I have not yet ascended to the Father. Why? The proving was that he could enter the presence of the Father without one spot of sin on him. Because sin cannot enter the presence of a thrice holy God. Mm. And so when he was done with that, then he came back. He said, touch me, handle me. Mm -hmm. For spirit hath not flesh and bone as you see me have. Mm. Wow. So the proving had taken place. And we can see that in Romans 5, 8, God said, but God commended his love toward us that in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. John declared, behold, the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. And then he said he was slain before the very foundation of the world. So this was already laid. The whole plan was laid out. It was not a surprise to God that Adam the male and Adam the female were going to sin and mess everything up. The Bible says that all of this was created for his good pleasure by him and for him were all these things created. And then we flip over to the book of the revelation of who? Jesus Christ. And it says... In 22, verse 17, and the spirit and the bride say, come and let him that heareth say, come and let him that is a thirst come and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely. 
And these people that stand up in the pulpit and disseminate doctrines of devils and tell people that are unsaved, you got to be truly repentant of all your sin before you can be saved. You got to try to wash away all this mess that's in your mind or in your life before Jesus can receive you is might way might as well be the devil himself standing up there preaching because it's a lie. Mm. And we have to expose them. And the false doctrine, it's not so much attaching the person, the false doctrine that they are disseminating, that is keeping people in bondage to sin. Because the strength of the sin is the law. And they have this law in their mind that is keeping them in bondage. And Jesus came to set the captives free. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. Amen. Uh you know, I think you said, uh, Brother Cripps, the um, uh, just as I am. Yeah. You know, that's a famous hymn. I really think it might be my all-time favorite hymn. There's all kinds of fantastic lines and actual doctrine in that hymn. But I think some of it goes, just as I am without one plea, except thy blood was shed for me. Mm. And that's the, that's the conclusion that we have to come to. We cannot go to a judgment and if God asks, why shall I let you into heaven? We think that we can present, any, uh, argue that, well, I'm a pretty good person. I did this, I did that. I stopped doing that. I stopped doing this and that. Now, if, if you're part of the, the, the argument, if you're talking about you, then you're, you're lost. You know, yes, your your plea must com be completely Jesus and His shed blood and His promise of eternal life to you. So, um, yeah, if Pearson thinks, well, I can, they can't. It's not possible to clean themselves like clean fish before you catch it. It's not possible to do that. It's not possible for us to clean up our life before we believe anyway. Yeah. But if a person does come to the conclusion, and they actually believe that. Uh, Jesus did what was required for me. Nothing else is required. He accomplished salvation for me, and I have eternal life because he promised it to me. When we believe that, we are instantly cleaned up. We are righteous. We're in good standing, a right standing before God. Uh, uh, we're sanctified. We're separated, declared holy at that mm -hmm. very moment. So just believe, and then Jesus you know, declares you righteous instead of you trying to make yourself righteous. Amen. All right. I like the way you present just one more thing, brother. Look, if you don't mind, I like the way you were you were talking about if someone comes and you know they they uh, have any other thing that they say, um, uh, God lays it out for us in His Word when He talks about that's exactly what will happen when the ones that are wicked say, "Well, didn't we do this and didn't we do that?" They they do exactly what we're talking about here is they use their own works as if that's going to be what saves them. Because that's what they're relying on here, and it's no different in eternity. When they stand before a righteous God, they're going to say, well, didn't we do this? Didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we do this and do that? And he's uh, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. So, yeah, that's, that that lays it out there even more. I like where you went with, with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't think uh, uh, Sister uh, Paula has commented on this one. Have you? But yeah, actually, I was the first one. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry. I remember. Yeah, you were quite quite succinct. Uh, <laughs> it, it, does anybody want to say more before I go to the next one? Yeah, oh. just one more quick point. Yeah, go ahead. Sun consciousness. S O N. See, they they have trick the world and and these people are just emissaries of the devil or deceived in what they're doing they have tricked the world with the dissemination of this false gospel message that inserts you really the spirit of antichrist inserts you in place of the sun and puts the focus on you and mm -hmm. what you're doing or what you haven't done and it's a trick because it's not about you it's about him what king jesus has done and when you look at what he has done for you his substitutionary death you begin to see that all of that stuff is a bunch of bunk 
a waste of time. It's a form of glory and in the flesh. It's a form of idolatry. They've literally turned you into the idol. People are worshiping themselves by way of their own works instead of putting the focus on King Jesus and worshiping him for what great things he has done. Mm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right, then. Uh, I just posted the next one. This one was submitted by Matthias. You'll probably, everybody will recognize it. Uh, and that is trying to make yourself believe is make believe. Uh, and this is something, this is something that I believe many people um, have, probably even most people I know, have never taken the time to actually think about this and ask themselves, what is believing actually? Now, I made a, a video titled um, Believe Defined because I wanted to make people understand that believing is, is not, uh, is not um, picking up your cross and, and uh, following Jesus, serving Jesus, all the things that many people want to make as part of the definition of believing. Um, but, uh, uh, but, but this is a little different issue here, and that is... Um, can a person make themselves believe anything? And uh, I've come to the conclusion that I can't make myself believe things. What, what, the way I, way I believe something is when I listen or study or uh, you know look into something and uh, at a certain point the evidence has convinced me and at a certain point I have been persuaded and that makes me, a, uh, then you can say I believed. But I, I cannot look at something and uh, not really believe and then just say, well, I'm going to believe it. That is that is something you can do, but it's it's not truly believing. Uh, so uh, that, uh, that's something that... Uh, uh, now, that presents a problem then also because we we want people to believe, but we... Can we tell them, well, just, just believe? No, all we can really tell them is tell them the gospel, answer the questions, teach them, ask them to get into the scriptures and study and pray, and that uh, uh, they will uh, pursue the truth and realize, Come to, I believe it's coming to a realization. Mm -hmm. Believing is kind of an epiphany of, of uh, coming to a real, realization of something. When you realize something, it, you, it hits you. I, I get it. I believe it. Uh, okay, Brother Cripps, what do you say? Yeah, I completely agree. And, and I, I think that the the sticking point for a lot of people is that, so does that mean that if I if I come to come to God and, and, and want to be saved and I struggle with my belief that, that, that I can't be saved? Um, and it's not saying that at all. Anyone that hears... Uh, here's the call. Anyone that uh, hears in their heart and hears the little knock, you know, anyone that answers, um, he makes it very clear in his word that he will come in and 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 eat with him, and and uh, he'll uh, the, mm -hmm. he'll be able to learn more about him. So um, I I just want to uh, caution people. It's it, it's not saying that you can't come to him. Um, it's just simply saying that you can't force yourself to believe. Either you believe something or you don't. And I wish uh, Paula V was was here because she has a great story about this that puts it into more uh, more of a uh, context where people can understand what it's actually saying. I don't want to steal her story, so uh, maybe when she comes back, she can. Yeah, go oh, I'm here. I'm oh. here. You can tell my story. No, Paula, you go ahead. Tell. I don't your know. I don't even know which story you're. The babysitting <laughs> story. The babysitting story uh, about about belief, choosing to believe or trust. Right. Um, well, yeah. you can tell that story because then I'll do a make-believe story. Okay. So the the concept is uh, Paula and Matthias were uh, trying to find a sitter and they couldn't find anyone. So they had someone um, that they didn't really trust, but they they were going to give it a try. They were going to decide to trust this person. And they went out and I think, I don't, I don't know, five or six times they were, they're you know, calling to check in, uh, might be exaggerating there, but she kept calling to check in because the truth was she decided to trust this person, but she didn't really trust him. And that's the concept that we're talking about in this scenario is that um, you can't just decide to believe what he did, you're, uh, what, what Christ did, that you're, 
you're presented with the evidence and you you come to believe it based on the evidence that's provided. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a blind faith, the people that use that. It's very frustrating. I've grown up hearing people say that. Just step out blindly in faith. No, he doesn't expect you to step out blindly in faith. Not when it comes to your salvation. Who would do that? Who would just say, well, I don't really believe, but I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to decide to believe and I'm going to put my eternal soul in the hands of someone that I don't really believe. I'm just deciding to believe. That's not what it is. You believe based on the evidence that the Holy Spirit out of his mercy and goodness will present to you when you come to him saying, I want to know more about you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I want to give everybody's thoughts on this, but uh, I, I've been, I talked to Renee and Matthias and also uh, someone else about this a lot recently. And uh, I am adamantly against uh, every aspect of Calvinism. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one of the points of Calvinism is that uh, uh, a person is unable to choose to believe or to, and that uh, I should say unable to believe with uh, because they don't have a free will and they're what's called um, the tea and tulip is most people call it total depravity but the Calvinist really takes it to the point of saying it's total inability no person has the ability to be a believer unless God makes them a believer and then the, the other people, uh, even if they wanted to be a believer, then uh, God won't let them. So that's Calvinism, and that's why I hate it, because uh, uh, I, I believe that anybody, anybody who wants to be saved can be saved. And yep. God's not going to say no to anybody if they want to be saved. Yep. But um, here's how I see this, and maybe I can get your everybody's feedback on this. That, um, I believe is something that uh, belief is something that happens when we when we get convinced uh, of something. Mm -hmm. Now, does God uh, impose the belief on us? Uh, no, I don't think He does. Just as God does not impose the belief on me, God does not prohibit the belief from me. Mm -hmm. uh, so, where does the belief come from? Well, uh, am I making myself believe? Well, I just got through saying. Uh, we can't ever make ourselves believe anything. I think believe is a neutral thing. God is not making us believe. God is not forbidding our belief. We can't make ourselves believe, uh, but all we can do is uh, listen. And if we do come to the conclusion that something's true, we, that, at that moment, we've believed. Amen. Uh, okay. Uh, who wants to go next on this? Uh, I would just I would just say really quickly that uh, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He's not going to make anyone do anything. He's going to present the information. It 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 needs to be you know leading up uh, to the moment of salvation. We do have free will. We're able to choose to to want to get to know Him more or not. To search for the treasure in the field, we're we're able. To, we have that option available to us. We can either. Uh, look for that or not look for that. We can just avoid it altogether and say, you know what, I, I don't want this. I'm not going to look for it. But the Holy Spirit's not going to force anyone or make anyone believe anything. He's going to present uh, the information when a person looks in his word and uh, or listening to um, someone else that's a believer and, and say, hey, I want to know more about that. And then um, you enter into the relationship with him and, and the, uh, in the seeking uh, process that happens as a result of that. And then if you, you keep doing it, eventually uh, you come to believe. You come to believe the, the evidence that's being presented to you. It's not going to force anyone is the point. All right. How about the sisters? What do you say? Um, I'll speak on the believe. Um I hear preachers all the time very rightfully say that um, all you have to do is believe. But uh, this is easy, I guess, or easier, seemingly, if you have some knowledge of the Bible and yeah. the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so many things that have to be a lie if the gospel's true. See, I came from an atheist point of view. I was not raised in the Christian religion. And so when I came face to face and thought, wow, God might be real, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know him yet, 
I didn't know anything that he said. And as I'm reading the Bible, it occurs to me that so many other things in the world just have to be a lie. Like, it's funny because earlier today, I wrote down some things that I was thinking about, like geology, space and a lie, anthropology, the study of man, archaeology, evolution, millions of years. I was raised to believe evolution is true. Every television show that you watch yep. promotes evolution. It talks as if it's fact already. And if you've never heard the truth, you just accept as fact. So to believe that the gospel, it's not just believing in the death, burial, and resurrection. It's believing that Jesus is God and that his word is 100% true. Mm -hmm. And that was not easy. But I would question him as I was reading the Bible, and he would bring me the answers in his word. Mm -hmm. And so after I read it, I was like, yes, you know, I, I believe this. Awesome. Great. And then I would run across questions on the internet, very reasonable, logical, you know, um, objections to why people did not believe the Bible. And I would get so nervous and my heart would start racing and I would start sweating and I would think, am I believing a lie? Mm -hmm. You know, because I had been lied to my whole life up to this point. Now I'm like, wait, is this is this a lie? Like when I found a contradiction. So I would ask God, I would look into it. And I always found that there was an answer. There was a, an explanation of why it, these verses didn't, weren't a contradiction at all. Right. So then I was like, well, how, you know, I'm not going to ever be able to have an answer for everything in the Bible. Like how much, you know, how long is this going to go on? And then someone read me one night, uh, Romans 10, 9. Uh, if thou shalt believe in thy heart uh, that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt, that's the middle part. That's what stood out at me, believe in your heart. Because I was like, well, I, I don't know how to do that. All I can do is believe in my head. How much information do I have to put in my head before it gets to my heart? Mm -hmm. And then that night, God showed me. Because uh, I asked him, I was like, how do I do this? And he said, you can't. It's him. He does it. Mm. And the, I ran across this verse the other day. I just want to share it before I'm done. It's Hosea 10, 9, 10, 12. It says, Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. Mm. Will he come and rain righteousness upon you? Ooh. So we seek the Lord. How long? Till he come and rain righteousness upon you. That mm -hmm. final salvation, that moment of salvation is all God. Amen. It's mm -hmm. all him. We have a choice up to that point, whether we're going to turn away or keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. But he has to show us and strip us of everything and show us that it's all him. And that's how we get the righteousness of Christ. He has to show us in his time as we seek him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there's more I want to say, but I, I want to hear from uh, Lisa and Paula first. Uh, Lisa or Paula? Yeah, I was just going to say that there's that old illustration of the rickety bridge that you're being, you know, led by a guide through the woods and they come to a, ravine you have to cross on this rickety looking bridge and the the guide says trust me i know this will hold you up and you say oh i believe you i i trust you i you know you're the best at this but i am not getting on that bridge that's that is not belief um and just a little fun fact on the greek the um um what was it the somebody mentioned just a bit ago on uh head and heart and the People at that time believed that the thinking was actually done by the heart. They weren't quite sure what the brain did, but that they believed that, you know, this beating thing in you is what where the seat of your understanding was. Mm -hmm. And so when they would say heart, heart and mind, they're not talking about your brain, really. They're talking about the, the inner you. And so when when people say believe in your heart, you know, when there's there's a verse that says believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. That's what it means. It's a, it's being convinced that something is true. Now, people can believe all sorts of things for the most frivolous reasons and believe wrong things. 
because they want them to be true or they just don't care and they'll just believe it because somebody else does mm -hmm. but or when it when it's in context of faith in the bible it means something specific and that's what's unique about our faith is this is a evidence-based faith it's not just somebody told you something and they did a miracle or something like that this is Jesus rising from the dead, eyewitnesses, friendly witnesses, hostile witnesses. And that's what is the core thing about our faith that is not like any of the others. And so that's why it's such a big deal and understand that. Amen. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that insight. Uh, um, Sister Elisa? I think the first thing that came to my mind when you started talking about this was the different evidences because it's always proposed by haters of God <laughs> that we just have this blind faith and we just operate based on, you know, the love of mythical characters or something or other. Yep. And we didn't prove this thing and search it out for ourselves to determine that these things were true. For example, there's a glaring example right now that they cannot deny, and that is B.C. and A.D. B.C. means before Christ. A.D. means Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord. Now, why is that there if Jesus is a mythical character? He is a historical figure, and that is a fact. And anybody that examines it has to be honest. There is more literary evidence about Christ than almost any other historical figure. No one doubts that Caesar is real. And there's only, I think, a few hundred documents that attest to his historical presence. Yeah. And there are over 25,000 manuscripts that indicate the Lord Jesus Christ walked on this earth. Mm -hmm. Now in his own words, Jesus said in the gospel of John, the 10th chapter, verse 38. And the context here is they were accusing Jesus that, you know, how dare you call yourself the son of God. And he said, listen, if you, if I do not the works of my father, then don't believe me. He said, but, in verse 38, but if I do, though ye believe me not, believe the works that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me mm. and I in him. So if we examine Christ, now that we have established, if you look historically, he was real, he did exist. Then you have all these people who are eyewitnesses to what transpired. See, this is what people don't get. They think we just believe, oh, we just, we just tiptoeing through the tulips, throwing, you know, tulips everywhere and flowers everywhere. And we didn't read anything. We didn't study anything. We didn't examine anything. So the first thing I thought about was the case for Christ, where this is sets out to disprove in a weekend that Jesus was a mythical character, that he wasn't even real. And the more he tried to come against it, the more evidence he got buried under. Yeah. And he ended up getting down on his knees and coming to faith in Christ because he couldn't disprove it. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing with all of us. And we didn't necessarily set out to disprove his existence, but I got saved as a child. And so when I read the scriptures and I saw what, first of all, was in the old covenant that was prophecy about Jesus and then reading his life on the earth and seeing what he could do and that there were witnesses and the witnesses were literally astonished by what he did, like the Roman centurion and other people who weren't even of the household of faith and yet they believed on him and saw his authority and recognized it and then you go to his death burial and resurrection and then you read in acts that there were 500 eyewitnesses mm -hmm. i mean there's evidence after evidence after evidence and i didn't even need all that because i saw 
as a child simply in faith that if he could do all of these things, turning water into wine and raising the dead and healing people simply by saying, go ahead, your servant is made whole. Go ahead and go home. Your servant is made whole. Well, who am I to disbelieve it? And I looked and I said, if he can do all this, he was God. And then you see his death, burial, and resurrection and his proclamation and his ascension. And you see him transform Saul of Tarsus, who was killing and persecuting Christians. You know, you have a hard time getting past that explanation. How could he ever be converted if Christ wasn't real? Amen. So we have evidence upon evidence upon evidence. The, you know, the Bible says the heavens declare the work of his hands. If someone's simply paying attention, you have to understand that there is uh, someone or something, whatever you may not know what to call it, greater than you when you just look at his creation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, there's there's just so much proof uh, if, if you do study all of the apologetic writings, uh, you'll see that it's, it's often said that uh, there's more proof for uh, this than just about anything historical event there, that ever happened. And uh, there's overwhelming evidence. But I want to talk for a moment about this idea of easy believism. Um, I'm, I personally am kind of sensitive to the... To the, the that term, I, I made a video titled "Easy, Easy Believism," and I defended it. I, I, I said I, I believe in easy believism, and I will wear it as a badge or a crown. I, I, I'm not embarrassed to, to say I believe in easy believism. But the the truth is that um, um, when I say easy believism, I mean that. Salvation is easy as believing. Nothing else is required. In other words, it's, it's believing in nothing else. That's why it's easy. It's not easy plus, you know, all these other things you've got to add to it to make it difficult. It's just believing. That's why it's easy, easy believism. But is it easy for people to believe? My experience was uh, people tried to tell me about Jesus over and over again throughout my life, and I wasn't interested uh, until my mother died. And, and uh, for the first time, I had to face death and losing someone I loved, and I, I, I want my questions answered. What happens after we die? What's the purpose of life? Uh, which religion is true? And, and uh, I want to, uh, so I reached a point where I wanted answers. Now I'm interested and I'm seeking. I want to understand and know the truth. And when I read the Bible and I learned about how much Jesus loved me, that he was died for me. And I understood this gospel and I, it was not difficult for me to believe. I didn't have to ask myself or make a decision to believe. I didn't have to, uh, you know, struggle with it at all. I was just, I believed and I was jumping for joy. That's why I say to me, the test is if under, if a person really understands the magnitude of this free gift, eternal life. People have been traveling all over the world for centuries trying to find a fountain of youth or something for to gain eternal life through all cultures. They wanted to somehow gain eternal life and, and yet we have it. And, and if we if you believe you have it, nothing it should be the happiest moment of your life when you get it. You if you really believe that's what you've got. Yep. So it was easy for me to believe. But it's very hard. I couldn't have believed it before that point. I wasn't ready. Uh, and mo many other, all the Lordship heretics, it's hard for them to believe that all, all that's required is believing. So it, so it's not easy. It's hard to believe. It's easy believing doesn't work for them. It's hard for them. It's impossible for them. Mm -hmm. But uh, all that's required is believing. But to believe that all, that all that that is all that's required is hard. Mm -hmm. Okay, any, any more from anybody? I, I just want to add that uh, I believe that the, the Holy Spirit, again, if a person really, really wants to seek him with everything, they really, really dig into it, um, the Holy Spirit knows exactly what that person, like you said, Brother Luke, uh, people talk to you about it, you weren't ready. 
Well, the Holy Spirit knew what you needed as part of the evidence that convinced you eventually. And uh, so he he's willing to do whatever he needs to do, the Holy Spirit uh, meeting, um, will uh, present that information to you. Um, to give you exactly what you need to come to belief in him. It's not, nothing anyone has to worry about. Right, no, amen. Um, and uh, on this one, you know, see if this will make sense because believing and trusting are so synonymous synonymous uh they they are equal in many ways if not the exact same but um if you have to choose or decide to believe something then by default at this moment you don't believe it because you had to choose to believe it. Mm -hmm. If you truly did believe it, or if you truly did trust it, there would be no decision involved. You just would. Mm -hmm. So by the mere fact of trying to make yourself believe something, rather than believing it downright as it is, persuaded by the evidence, mm -hmm. trying to make yourself believe something is nothing more than make belief. Yeah. 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 Boom. Yeah, I, I, I really think that uh, the, the main problem in humanity is pride. Mm -hmm. uh, pride caused the fall from the, the angels. Pride was the cause of the fall of um, Adam and Eve. Pride is what prevents people from uh, re just re relying on Jesus. They think that they don't need him. They're good enough on their own. And uh, uh, we... Only when we uh, have this pride go away and end up being humble, realizing that, hey, I am incapable of, of um, making myself acceptable to God and that uh, I need it to be saved, mm -hmm. uh, then, uh, so that means that something has to happen in a person to bring them to a point. Maybe it's life events. Yeah. Maybe it's some, sometimes people won't get on their knees unless they get knocked down on their knees. But um, I know in my case, and I, I don't want to impose my experience on anybody. I, just because things went happened to me in a certain way as I got saved, uh, it's not everybody's not required to be a carbon copy of my experience. <laughs> but I I do think that when people get saved, it's because they are ready to believe something has happened to prepare them where they they want to know God, and uh, they're so they're ready to to listen and hear and open up their mind and heart. Yeah. And when the tr truth is presented, then they end up believing. Yeah. Um, yes, Luke, that's what happened to me. Uh, just like the death of your mother brought you to Jesus, whereas before you weren't even interested. Um, the birth of my child as she was growing up uh, brought me to God because I didn't know what was right and wrong. I didn't know how to raise her. I started feeling differently politically and about different things as I was raising this little person. And I was found myself raising her exactly as I was raised, just putting in her in front of the TV. And I knew that was wrong. And I was like, well, what's right and what's wrong? Before that, I would have rejected the gospel out outright. Because someone had already given me the gospel and convinced me that I believed in that moment when I was 16 mm -hmm. and never told me to talk to God, never told me to read the Bible, mm -hmm. just declared me saved. And it was like it was supposed to be some sort of magic spell and nothing changed. Uh, nobody was talking about God. Nobody I knew went to church or nothing about heaven, hell, sin, nothing in the world. So nothing was confirmed by what this guy said so i just thought well that was some sort of magic spell that didn't work on me and so in my mind i thought i tried christianity and it's it's bs yeah mm. um but it did take I, when you are telling your story when i think about and and my story i think it i, I look at the parable of the sower and the seed because the seed is the same the only variable that's different is the soil. The last one was put into good soil. And so I, I think the soil is like the heart. There has to be 
there's some, for me anyway, there had to be some sort of preparation in order to accept the truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, the, the parables and uh, Jesus was asked, well, why do you make it so complicated? No, they don't, nobody understands what you mean. And he says, I'm doing it on purpose. I, I, I don't want them to understand unless their heart is prepared right. They got to have the right heart attitude. Otherwise they won't get it. And I think that's that's exactly what's going on with all of us. Unless we have our heart uh, right, uh, we're not going to be able to understand and, and believe. Um, all right. Uh, the next one is uh, um, if it is not good news, it is not the gospel. I'd like to start with Lisa on this one. If it is not good news, then it's not the gospel. Yeah, that... That's something that took me years to really come to understand, being that I got saved so young because of all the nonsense that one does encounter when you first begin your Christian walk. There have been so many different things that I have witnessed in my short time on this plane that are just astonishing. But Did you say plane? having... Yeah, oh, the plane, okay. the, Thank you. the earth. Yep. Um, uh, it just helped me come to an understanding very early on that there were false um, ideologies, concepts, and it always had one thing in common, though. It, it they always dismiss the Lord Jesus Christ. And every time I started adding that up and you looked at the different religions, they always relegated Jesus off to the corner somewhere. He wasn't the center. He wasn't the focal. The only one was true biblical Christianity. Everything else pushed Jesus off to the side. And yet with my personal experience, I knew he was the center. <laughs> he was the all in all. He was the everything, you know, by him. I was just reading that today, how all these things were made by him and for him and by him, all these things consist. And I, I understood that this was all demonic in its attack and its obfuscation of who he is, because the objective is to keep men in darkness, because if they can see Christ, which he's a reflection off of us. That's why it's so important that we do let the light of, of Christ shine like what we're doing tonight. Mm -hmm. We're contending for the faith. We're sharing our faith. We're sharing our understanding. We're sharing the revelation that God has revealed to us through his scripture, through his word, and through our experience and our walk with him. And so when I looked around and I saw these different things coming against Christ, I knew, I knew that. I had a relationship with the creator that he was mine and I was his. And so it didn't matter what someone said. It didn't matter their blasphemy. It didn't matter their disbelief. I was convinced and convinced not by make believe. I was convinced by the evidence Mm -hmm. And so I would share that with people in my life, people that I met that were unbelievers. I would share them my conviction. I would share with them my understanding of the scripture. I would share with them with who Jesus is. And as I grew and learned in faith, a lot of the things that I had learned that I say were biblical misnomers, things that we learned incorrectly that really just came out of denominationalism, not in the Bible, they weren't the doctrine of Christ. And when I started aligning myself with what was clearly in the scripture, what could be clearly understood, what could be clearly discerned, a lot of that mess just started to fall off like scales, just, mm -hmm. w just falling off. Mm -hmm. Because now it was about relationship. It wasn't about keeping dogma from the church or any list of rules. 
It was about growing in grace and in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ and transforming my mind by the word of God, as the Bible says we're supposed to do. Amen. Wonderful. You're muted. Brother Luke, your mic's not on. I, I had to mute it for a second. I got a phone call, but... Uh, um, Sister Paula V, uh, the, the truism is, if it is not good news, then it is not the gospel. Um, what do you say about that? Um, I would say true. <laughs> <laughs> um, the good news is so good, I had a hard time believing it could be true. Um, here you are getting this, the greatest gift ever in the world and you can't work for it you're you're um the things that you do don't matter it doesn't matter how bad you've been it's the same gift for everyone that was hard to believe yeah. it really was i was hardened by the world and i thought you know uh, if it sounds too good to be true it probably is yeah. and so I, I see a lot of people struggle with this as well but they they're coming from a different point of view because they have all this good works that they've done their whole life. Yeah. And it's hard for them to separate all the good that they've done and see that it's not that goodness that gets them in. It's their belief in Christ. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it is good news. It's, um, it's great news. And, uh, and the bad news needs to be presented as well. Otherwise, you don't understand why it's good news. Um, the part of being a sinner and deserving hell is uh, was easy for me. It was very easy for me to say, yes, I've done wrong. <laughs> I've been very bad. I've sinned. But I see a lot of people that were raised in church that were good their whole lives. They, they struggle with this, like Daniel's story. If you've ever heard Daniel's testimony, you know, he didn't do any of the bad stuff the other kids did. And God had to bring him to a point and show him that his belief in his own goodness was just as wretched as all those other bad things the other boys did. So, um, yeah, it is good news. It's great news. Mm -hmm. uh, and that that's, that's why it's sometimes hard to believe, I think, for people. All right. Thank you. I, I seem like Brother Cripps is raring to go. What I'm, always, I'm always raring to go. <laughs> what do you say? There's no better news. It, it's not only good news, it's the news. It's the good news. There's there's no other news that's any better. I mean, we're talking about a, a, a perfect loving God who loved us so much that that he planned before the foundations of the uh, of the world, the plane, uh, uh, how to rescue us, how to, how to reconcile us back to himself. That's how much he cares about us, that he sent his son into the world to save us from, uh, from sin. And, um, and also, uh, we don't have to do anything to get it. It's not based on our filthy righteousness rags. It's based on uh, Christ alone through faith alone with nothing added. That's good news. Good news that we don't have to we don't have to go to hell. Hell is bad news. Absolutely, it's bad news. Um, and and I don't want to see anyone go there. But the good news is you don't have to go there. That we can all be saved, and and God wants that. He wishes that all would come to repentance, change of mind. Um, so it's good news. I agree. It's good news. It's the best news. There's no news that's better than that. Um, yeah. Okay, thank Amen. you. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask someone to interact with me for a moment here. I, I made a video uh, a couple of years ago uh, titled, uh, I just won $10 million from Publishers uh, Cheering House. Instead of Publishers Clearing House, I said Publishers Cheering House, thinking maybe I'll get in trouble if I misrepresented that I won the Publishers Clearing House prize. <laughs> uh, but, so I make this video and I go through this act. I'm so ha telling what happened. I'm so happy. And this is, it goes up briefly. Uh, look, I, uh, 
they came to my door and, and when I opened up the door, there's like everybody celebrating and saying, look, you get $10 million, you're the winner. Yeah, it's, take it, it's yours, it's free. And, and also uh, anybody you tell about it, they'll also get $10 million. And so, uh, I mean, I'm jumping for joy. And, and of course I relate it to the gospel that not only is it so it's great news for us, but it's great news, why not, hey, if everybody else can have the same $10 million or the same eternal life in this case, why would we not tell others about it, wanting them to have it too? Mm -hmm. uh, but here's the test. Uh, let me ask Sister Lisa to play along with me, Sister. Okay. I knock on your door and I say, here's a check for $10 million, but uh, it's yours, but I can't let you have it. Uh, until you go 10 years and 10 years from now, uh, you can have it. Uh, but during that 10 years, you cannot say one bad thing or do one bad thing or even have one bad thought. What are you going to say? <laughs> I, you're, you, I think you're, are you going to say, I, wait, I said, this is really good news, isn't it? No. <laughs> no, it's not, because I already know I, I done lost before we got started. Yeah, me too. I lost in your case. <laughs> it, it's it's not good news if there's all these contingencies and impossible demands on you. It's That's no right. longer good news, is it? No. It's only good. That no, wouldn't be very with, good news with, at all. Yeah, only with the true gospel is it really good news. And when we add anything to it and ruin it, it's no longer good news. That's the test. And it, does a peace person feel like this is really good news, or oh no, I I got to rip get it sent completely out of my life and then keep my fingers crossed hoping that someday I'll get that 10 million and no yeah that wouldn't be good news for you wow well yeah and it also you could also add in there is like Jesus is the one that went and earned that 10 million Ooh. and he gave it to you and then he told you freely you ever receive freely give so he'll say brother Luke every time you go to give it I'm gonna multiply it so you'll always have enough to give to someone else Ooh. So there's no strings attached and mm -hmm. and these lord shippers and all these other false religions every way they lay out there's always tentacles there's always strings attached just like the but jesus was. gave it freely he paid the price and all we do is receive what he did that's it yeah yeah um uh, I've been saying this for a couple of years, and I, as I say it, I still have some reservations about saying it because I don't want to uh, put, put a demand on people that they have to react the way I think they should react. And that is, I say that it's uh, this uh, salvation, this gospel, eternal life. It is uh, such good news that if you really believe it, you really understand how the magnitude of it, and you really believe it, it's yours your reaction be, should be jumping for joy. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, not everybody's emotional, so maybe they wouldn't jump for joy. But, but I heard Malcolm Smith recently in a video, he said exactly the same thing. That's always interesting. Sometimes I think I come up with an original expression, and then I find out that somebody else said it before me or, or in addition to me. But he says, the gospel is the great news that makes a person jump for joy. Mm. Uh, but if it's not that joyful kind of a message, if it doesn't bring you that kind of joy, then it must not be the real gospel. Uh, Sister Paula? Yeah, the thing is that what most people spread over the centuries is more like fire insurance that they're selling. Ooh. You know, it's selling fire insurance is what they do. They, they're they trying to scare you into a relationship, and you can't do that. You can't trick people into it. It it. If they understood, our message is according to First Corinthians fifteen, be reconciled to God, or is that Second Corinthians five? I get the two of them mixed up as far as which says what. One says that he was, you know, this is the gospel that he was uh, died, buried, and raised the third day. But the point is that it's a relationship; it's an adoption offer. And how can that be anything but good news? When who wouldn't want to be adopted? You know, and it, it's of course it's going to be better. But the thing is that even if it wasn't better, it it's still you belong to somebody then, and you didn't before. And so, 
how can we make it into something bad news by saying, well, if, if you know, you're this loathsome worm that deserves eternal hell and you shouldn't, you know, you should be just out of fear, accept this, this gift. And that is not what God wants. No, that, that's not what Jesus came to do. He just like, look, I'm evening the playing field that getting back to the easy believism. Well, what they want it to be hard believism. I mean, it <laughs> makes it so no matter who you are, it's, it's the same within the same reach of everybody. Mm -hmm. And so that that's, yeah, good news. Why aren't we spreading that? I just don't get mm -hmm. what motivated people all these years to spread, to say otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did everybody uh, respond to that one? Uh, if it's not good news, it's not the gospel. Yeah. Okay. The next one I just posted, and uh, this was submitted by uh, Brother Daniel, and it's it says, it's an acronym, G period, R period, A period, C period, E period. So grace is God's righteousness at Christ's expense. So grace is, grace spelled out is an acronym for God's righteousness at Christ's expense. Who wants to talk about that? Ladies, come on, brother Cripps. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh, God's righteousness at Christ's expense, a hundred percent accurate. Uh, obviously, it's um, uh, we get the righteousness, the reconciliation that I mentioned, uh, to God comes through his son, uh, and he's the one that paid our expense, he paid all our debt, all of our sin debt. Um, he suffered and died and was betrayed and spit upon and all the things that he suffered. Um, he did that in our place. It was his expense. He paid all. We owe nothing once once we accept his free gift. Um, he, he's paid it all. Uh, we don't owe it anymore. Um, it's been, our account has been marked paid. He has redeemed us. He has... Um, he has totally reconciled us to God and certainly was at Christ's expense at the sacrifice of his own son. That's mm -hmm. a good one. I haven't heard that one before. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so when, when people talk about grace and they ask, well, what is grace? And uh, I think that's a good way of explaining. Of course, grace means that, uh, that God is being gracious. He's giving us a kindness, something that is not really deserved or earned by us. It's only because he's being gracious. Mm. But uh, this is another way of understanding. But what we're really getting out of this here is that I think if you ask anybody, um, the, you know, the diagnostic questions I encourage everybody to ask is uh, ask your friends and family, uh, are you certain you're going to go to heaven? Are you certain you have eternal life? And if you are certain, based on why? Why? And uh, the t the tip the answer you're going to get from almost everybody and everybody's talking about Roman Catholics last night and I've never met a Roman Catholic that answered this correctly um, but Roman Catholics and almost all the religious people of the world they they answer the question well I, I'm not really certain I'm hopeful I'm sure pretty sure I think I will and and the reason is because I'm a pretty good person that you know. I go to church and I try to do good deeds. And I even follow the uh, the Ten Commandments and uh, the uh, um, <laughs> what's the thing Jesus said? Do it the the Golden Rule. So they they would say I do this, I do that. So, so they're saying all the things that they do to that, that God might approve of, and. Uh, so uh, people think that somehow that they're going to, whether they get to be in heaven, it'll be determined on personal merit. And if they have a certain degree of righteousness or goodness, um, and they, they don't know what degree is required. And of course, we know that what they have to have is perfection. Amen. When they understand that they have to they have perfection, then that should make them understand how impossible it is and their need for Jesus. But people do generally say that uh, if, if I'm a pretty good person, God 
will probably accept me. Um, but this is, grace is, in this case, says grace is God's righteousness. So we have the righteousness of God. This is the imputed righteousness, the great transaction. Our sins were charged against Jesus. We, his righteousness is credited to us. So we have perfect righteousness. That what is, that's exactly what's needed. But how do we get it? At Christ's expense. Expense means, well, if it's expensive, it costs something. Yeah. Well, what did it cost? Jesus paid for it with his own, God paid with his own blood, the, the Bible says. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's all there in that saying. It, it, grace is God's righteousness at Christ's expense. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, uh, who, who else wants to comment on that one? Um, I'll comment. Go ahead. Uh, what you, I, I do like the, what's it called, an, an acronym mm -hmm. um, that Daniel came up with. Um, but I was thinking about something when you were talking about the Catholics and, and other religions who kind of uh, weigh out their good versus their evil deeds. Um, that's the way that makes sense. That's just what makes sense to a man. That's why the gospel, I think, is hard for some because they're like, wait, <laughs> I once had this girl over. She was invited to one of our Bible studies and I was telling her about, you know, I was giving her the gospel. And she's like, wait, so you're saying that someone who barely has done any bad things in their life and someone who's murdered people, they have the same promise of eternal life and this free gift. And I was like, yeah. And she's like, that's so wrong. And I was like, no, it's wonderful. I was like, it's wonderful. Don't you see? I was like, because take two people. One person is raised in a Christian home. They're told the word of God from birth. Another person is maybe raised by a prostitute and their, their father's a pimp and they live, you know, in the ghetto. Um, this child that's raised in the good home is going to have a pretty good life and they're probably going to, you know, uh, do what they're supposed to do because of their surrounding. And the other person is going to see life very differently and they're going to do what they've seen others do. And it's wonderful because God levels the playing field. He makes us all the same. Mm. And that's what the righteous in their own mind, that's what they cannot get past. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's what I have to say. Yeah. About. yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Uh, I've got another acronym, but does anyone want to say more about that one before we go to the next? Yeah, acronym? I do. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, I committed this one to memory because I loved it when I heard it. it was what Dr. Curtis Hudson said. He said that grace was God's unmerited favor to hell deserving sinners without any expectation of return on the part of the sinner. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I love Curtis Hudson as much as you do. We, we, we both have a Curtis Hudson playlist on our channels. Yeah, I do have a couple yeah. of them. Yeah, yeah. All right, the, the, there's another acronym that was submitted by Daniel, and it, it is G-R-A-C-E is God rejects any carnal efforts. Hmm. That's true. God rejects any carnal efforts. I mean, really, I mean, there, there, it's... It's profound. I mean, for a person to think that they can, they can, uh, their effort, well, I'm trying, I'm doing this. As long as you're trying, as long as you're doing the best you can. <laughs> no. All right. Uh, uh, Sister Paula, what do you say? God rejects any carnal efforts. Yeah. I mean, is this the difference between uh, the gift of faith or the gift of salvation by faith and rewards that you earn? through your works there this is a, a key distinction that people don't make because as it says in us first corinthians 3 that a person can lose everything that their works were tested and and burned up because they were shoddy material but they themselves will be saved as one through the flames so it you can't mix a gift and a work a gift and a wage 
It's what Jesus was saying when he did the, the parable of the wineskins. He said, you can't put new wine in old wineskins or repair old cloth with new cloth. He was saying something really radically different was coming and people try to blend that, whether it's just Hebrew roots or Lordship salvation or whatever it is, they try to blend that and do exactly what Jesus said not to do because you can't. It's too different, it's incompatible. It's not the same operating system. So that's this is why we have to understand these basic things you wouldn't think would be so difficult, but for some reason it is. Yeah. 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 So uh, God rejects any carnal efforts. Uh, boy, uh, isn't that really the, the root of the problem? Oh, yeah. People always think that it's their effort that matters, their accomplishment, their ability to get sin out of their life, their ability to do good deeds and build up uh, this good and bad uh, scale, get that balance scale so that the, it tilts in their favor more good than bad. And and uh, But all the carnal efforts that we make are all rejected. It's all filthy rags in God's sight. Right. Hey, Brother Luke, I just had a thought. Yeah. And that was that salvation is like a vehicle. It's the vehicle, it's a vehicle given to us by God. And and the only thing is the stipulation that he has, the only fuel that'll work in it is the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So you have a vehicle that's given by God and it's powered by the Holy Spirit and people are trying to use their own human efforts to power the vehicle that was given and designed by God. Ain't gonna work. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that that applies to, the, to those of us who have the Holy Spirit and think then that uh, we're gonna through our own efforts going to make the changes and, and do the works and instead of knowing that, see, I always say that, look, I tell them the gospel, I'll answer their questions, but now it's between them and Jesus. It's out of my hands, okay? Now, okay, now they believe they got the Holy Spirit. Uh, I want them to mature, grow and mature and serve, but uh, that's not my job. That, that's between them and the Holy Spirit. How will they respond to the Holy Spirit living in them? And so, uh, yeah. We're powered by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's the one that will create the changes and create the good works in us. So what we need to, you know, I've always objected. I think we all agree that we never want to tell someone to get saved. You've got to surrender your life, you know, as a prerequisite. Um, but I will say that after we're saved, the more you can surrender your life and, and, and your will over to the Holy Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit to transform you, uh, the, the more you'll grow. And, serve amen okay uh okay i got it anybody want to say more about that one uh before we go to the next one god rejects any carnal efforts brother cripps yeah the carnal efforts are i mean we're born into sin so we're born zombies uh, you know uh, carnal um so what we want is to accept the spiritual we want to be slaves to righteousness instead of slaves to sin um, and that's the transaction. So yes, God rejects the carnal because he, he needs uh, perfection. And the only way that we're perfect is through the sacrifice of the son. So that makes total sense. I don't, I don't think I need to say more than that. I think that that uh, pretty much gets it. I completely agree. Mm -hmm. All right. Man. All right. Uh, the next one I posted is grace does not make light of sin but it does make much of Christ. That one makes me happy. All glory to Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Amen, amen. Yes, yes. So, you know, people uh, attack us. This is another thing. Uh, people will, will say you're hyper grace, greasy grace, you know, all this, and try to insult this grace that God gives us and all of it is so insulting because they they're really insulting god and and uh or what he's done but he this one really puts it right in the right perspective uh, people want to act like 
we're making light of sin because we're we have this grace, even hyper grace. Oh, too too much grace. You're making light of sin. You're giving people a license to sin. No, grace does not make light of sin. It just makes much of Christ. Mm. I love that. Mm. I love that. Well, I, I like to say something real quick, Brother Luke. Yeah. Greasy grace. Okay, let's take that. Yeah, it. they actually are mocking the living God. But if we look at it in light of the scripture, they're actually not wrong. Because we are covered in him. And we slip right through the devil's fingers. So I'll take the greasy grace number one number two the other one what was it that you said hyper grace yeah, yeah the bible said where sin does abound grace does much more abound so i'll take hyper grace too i'm not offended yes amen <laughs> god's amen. grace is hyper <laughs> yeah it is yeah yeah if it's if it's not hyper, then it's not really grace, is it? It's not grace. No, it's not grace at all. And if if, if okay, if the if the level is accept uh, perfection that we need to attain, and we can't do it in our own power, and we need grace in order to do that, then it better be hyper. <laughs> I've got a lot of sins to cover, and yeah. and anybody that says they don't, I mean, they're fooling themselves. <laughs> yeah. We sin in ways David David prayed for the the sin that he was unaware of. So how often do we sin? Uh, we don't even know that we sin. So the people that say, "Oh, I, you know, I I live my life I'm in imperfection. You know, I'm capable of doing it. Um, I, I don't sin." They're they're sinning in that statement in and of itself. They're sinning right there. Yeah. Yeah. My my answer uh, to the the pejoratives. Um, uh, hyper grace, uh, easy believism is, well, what you're guilty of is easy legalism. Yeah. Now you're guilty of cheap law. You know, they, they, they want to act like, uh, following the law is needed. Uh, and yet they can't follow the law there. So what they have to do is they water it down so much. But Jesus would not allow us to do that because he says, well, you think it's murder, you know, it's just murdering somebody. But I'm telling you, even if you hate someone, you've already murdered them in your mind and in your heart. Mm -hmm. So as Jesus wants us to know that there's no way that you can water down your condemnation and your sin, uh, trying to kind of whitewash it. And uh, uh, even it's not just the bad things you do. It's even your thoughts. Yeah. You can't even have a evil thought. Yep. So if that's the case, uh, wow, uh, th th these people, no one is should, they should realize that it's impossible. That's the conclusion that, that uh, the apostles came to when Jesus talked to the rich young ruler and he went away dejected and the apostles had been listening and they were saying, wow, if all this is required, then, then how is it possible for anyone to get saved? Yeah. And Jesus said, with man, it is impossible. Yes. I think Jesus, I think Jesus went like this. Ah, oh, you get it. You finally get it. Yeah. I've been trying to illustrate to you the impossibility of working your way to heaven by saying you got to cut off your hand and gouge out your eye and sell everything you own. And now you get it. It's impossible to do all these things, isn't it? That's why you need me. Yeah. I like that. That's good. Yeah. I think the ones that don't truly understand grace are the ones that are always talking about sin. Oh, yeah. Constantly. Yeah. Constantly. It's almost as if they don't believe that Jesus died for the sins of the world. Yeah. Um, they're always focused on sin. If you listen to a preacher that's constantly trying to condemn you of your sin, they, they don't mention grace. They barely talk about Jesus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a, it's sort of a control tactic, and it just proves that they don't understand grace yeah. because there is no condemnation. Yeah, there's a who are in Christ. Yeah, mm. yeah. Sister Paula, uh, uh, there's several good ones we had last week that re that make that point, and I'll repeat it real quickly. It says salvation is not a sin issue; it is a son issue, mm. and uh, also. Uh, uh, it's called salvation, not probation. The gospel is believe, not behave. 
religion says do, but Jesus says done. Mm. Mm. So uh, those are some of the things that drive home that point. Uh, Wonderful. All right, the, the next one, um, repent of your repentance. <laughs> <laughs> How about uh, Sister Paulo? You think we should repent of our repentance? Change your mind about changing your mind? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, change your mind about thinking that repentance is is, is yeah. uh, stop sinning. <laughs> yeah, people almost always assume that's what it's meant be it means because that's what they've always been told. That you have to, you know, when they'll, they'll mix that up with the verse says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins. But that's not how you got saved. Mm. You know, it, it's like what um, the Apostle Paul said at the end of Galatians 2, I think it is, <clears throat> if righteousness could be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. So how, how can repenting of breaking the law do anything? It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. 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 Brother Cripps, I mean, we make a big deal about uh, trying to straighten people out on this word. It's it's probably the most misunderstood, misapplied word in the Bible, I think. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. How so, many times? Uh, how many times is necessary to repent? Well, for salvation, one time. You one need time. To change your mind about how to get saved. That's what we we mean. Yeah, of course. And then the, then, but then after we're saved. We should be uh, constantly repenting in terms of changing our mind or attitudes about about things that God wants us to change our mind about. But mm -hmm. uh, it's not connected to uh, salvation except change your mind about how you get saved. Change your mind about uh, you know, your need and complete dependence on Jesus for salvation. Yeah, and that's so. Um, in those terms, it makes sense. So we we repent. How's the phrase? Repent of our repentance. Or yes, yes. Repent of your repentance in that the way mis may the way re repentance is generally understood. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it's necessary because if, if we're seeing it as repent is repentance of sins and that we continue to do that and we can lose our salvation because guess what? That, you know, the, oh my gosh, I remember the story that I heard in a Sunday school Never forgot it. The guy was, uh, guy was saying like, if you're, if you're driving down the road and you're in a car and there's a there's a hot woman walking by the side of the road and you have lust in your heart and you hit a telephone pole and die, you're going to hell. So if someone believes that, they need to repent of their repentance for sure. Um, mm -hmm. That's not what it's all about at all. Um, you know what. You have in that story, you have a natural consequences, not natural consequence. You might pay the natural consequence of you taking your eyes off the road and not paying attention to your driving and running into a telephone pole, uh, whether it be death or injury or whatever. But for the lusting in your heart, yeah, of course, um, you know, you want to change your mind about doing that. But uh, as far as salvation is concerned, yeah, we definitely need to repent of our repentance for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, anybody, anybody else? Repent of your repentance. <laughs> mm. um, yeah. I'll go. Oh, sorry, Lisa. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, the, re the word repent is really used uh, a lot in um, the church for control, but also, you know, to shut up the kingdom of God. Yeah. I've heard a lot of people get up there and say their testimonies and they say, you know, and Jesus saved me and I stopped my drinking and I stopped my smoking and I stopped my running around. And it's like, that's great. Wonderful. But that's not what saved you. Yeah. <laughs> and it's so closely associated if, if they are indeed even saved that, you know, I don't think they could be because if that's the evidence that they're pointing to, not the word of God and what he has said, it's almost like they're stealing from God. They're stealing the glory that belongs only to God. Um, so yeah, repent of the sin of your repentance from sin. <laughs> yes. Wow. Yeah. They're trying to get through it another way. 
right? I mean, they're get they're trying to get through another way, and that's laid out in Scripture. If anyone that tries to yeah. to get there another way, other than the uh, other than through Christ, they're a thief and a liar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Sister Paula, you you must have something to say about the word repentance, and you want people to repent of their repentance. Well, uh, you know, again, you know, there's just nothing really new to add to that, but that the point, I guess, can be emphasized that it, it means just to change your mind. And one thing I always point to is what, what Peter said at Pentecost, repent and be baptized, is very different from what Paul said at Mars Hill. And there's a reason for that, because the Jews had to change their minds about who Messiah was. Mm -hmm. And they already believed in the one true God, but that didn't save them. They had to accept Jesus as Messiah. And the, the Greeks had to know who Jesus was in the first place and that he rose from the dead was the important thing. And so it, it's the repentance part was if you have something you need to change your mind about and your acceptance about that, that's really all it is. You never, uh, the, the sin, quote unquote, that, that, Peter is pointing his finger at the Jews about is you killed your Messiah. And they, they were collectively guilty of that. And they said, let his blood be on our heads and on our children's heads when they were, you know, screaming for him to be crucified. So they were held accountable for that and they needed to renounce what they had done as a people. And so repent depends on context too. You know, they had to change their minds about what who Jesus was, but they also had a grievous collective national sin to repent of. That again is not how individuals are saved, but it's something the nation needed to do, mm -hmm. and just you know to accept him. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, uh, I, um, I'm pretty sure I'm right on this. Um, I I know that the Gospel of John. Um, and, and near the end, John wrote, the reason he wrote the gospel was to tell us how to get saved. There's no other book in the Bible that claims that is the uh, intention of the writer. That's the purpose of the book. And if that's the case, um, the word believe in one form or another uh, appears uh, 99 times in the gospel of John. Now, if repenting uh, was also part of it, believing and repenting, the way most people think of it, if it was required, then then uh, it should say 99 times, believe and repent. But, and yet the word repent doesn't appear a single time in the Gospel of John. Believe, 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 99 times, zero repents. So that should settle the issue. Now the Apostle Paul, many people think he's the only one that had the gospel. Of course, they, they go too far. But I, I give Paul credit for not only agreeing with Jesus and Peter and John and on, the, on believing for salvation, but he took it a step further and said, not only is it true that you believe for salvation, but if you add anything else to it, you've ruined it. So he, made, uh, he really clarified it. Uh, that uh, it's, it's faith alone. And so uh, if, if we can count on Paul to get this gospel exactly right, then what did Paul say about repent? I believe in all the Pauline epistles. I think he only used the word repent twice. I think it was, I think it was in 2 Corinthians or something. I, he said, well, I, I, uh, I don't repent about sending you that letter I'm, I'm not sorry. I don't regret it. In other words, I forgot the other time he used it. But again, if 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 repenting of our sins was a requirement for salvation, Paul should have been using that word over and over and over again. All right. Amen. Okay. The uh, the next one is uh, I'll post it here. Uh, Daniel submitted this. He says, uh, some say it's not fair for you to freely get salvation while I work so hard for it. <laughs> <laughs> here, let me, let me, let me see if I can say it. It's, uh, 
Um, people get so mad at me because I get for free what they're working so hard for. Same thing, but just a little shorter. But yes, a little more of a punchline with it. Yeah. It's, uh, well, you can repeat. I'll read his, the, what I have, and then you can say it again. Uh, some say it's not fair for you to freely get salvation. So I, I could be talking to someone and they say, it's a free gift. I say, it's not fair for you to get free. I'm working really hard for it. That's the attitude. That's the resentment. That's, that, that's why they hate this, this gospel. And, and how do you phrase it, uh, brother? Well, basically the same thing. Uh, people get so angry with me, uh, or people get so angry because I got for free what they're working so hard to get. Yeah. It's it's anger and maybe jealousy. Uh, it, was, it would only be jealousy if they believed it was true. <laughs> right? I think it's... Uh, I, I think when people see the confidence in, that we have in Christ... And they think, oh, he's so prideful and arrogant. It's like, no, if we if we had our confidence in anything of ourselves, it would be basically just like yours. But ours is in Christ. So uh, I, I don't know if it's jealousy, but it is an anger that they get. It's a discomfort because they honestly want it themselves. Mm -hmm. hmm. Let me ask uh, Darlene to clarify something that I, I'm, I don't understand. Uh, Darlene wrote sincitypreacher at gmail.com. Uh, can you see the question from it's Hendrix? It's Kendrix, it says. Kendrix. I, I don't I don't know what you're referring to. Please uh I, and, I think if, if you want me to respond to something, Darlene, let me make it a little more clear for me, okay? Yeah, I think she was talking about, um, she kept saying that she's been always told you have to keep confessing your sins, keep confessing your sins. And she's trying to understand what we're saying about that because she's been taught, you know, she's a new believer, I guess, and been taught that that's what you have to do all the time. Oh, Darlene is asking that question? Uh, no, not Darlene, uh, this no. other person, I think they, if unless I misread the name uh yeah. someone else uh what's the name uh it's that kendrick girl oh okay i see yeah all right i guess we could talk about that it's not really that's fine we'll we have to go into that uh, um or in, in first john um one nine i'm not sure i've got this exactly right but it says uh if if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to cleanse us, forgive us our sin, and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I've got it pretty close, I think. But yeah. the point, point being made there about sin, that in the Roman Catholics and others will think that we have to not only believe in Jesus, but continually confess our sin over and over again, like maybe go to the priest, confess our sin, and then we can take the, have communion and we're okay until we sin again. And that's a constant cycle of sinning, confessing, communion, sin, and, and, and hopefully you die at the right time when you happen to have not have any sin on you. Uh, that's the problem. That's how they misapply that verse. I, my opinion, on First John, uh, that particular portion of scripture is that um, uh, I believe the letter was written for the to be read to the whole congregation, and I believe the congregation is just like ours, and just like every congregation you you can go to. It, it, it's uh, you assume that many people there are believers, but sometimes they bring people are curious and they come as a guest. Some people bring their family and friends as a guest, and they're not believers. So I think that's the portion of the letter that uh, John is, is making this clear, that it, it, there are people, particularly the Gnostics of that particular time, were saying, were, they had a different view on sin. And, and he, was, he was saying, no, you cannot think that you're sinless. Nobody's sinless. If you, you have to confess or accept the fact, I recognize you are a sinner. It's not saying if we confess our sins continually, 
over and over and over again. It's that we have to admit and realize and come to the realization that we are a sinner and therefore we have a problem. Mm -hmm. we have a, there's an issue between God and man, it's sin. And so, if, but if you confess that you're a sinner and understand that and understand that Jesus paid for your sin, then, then you're, of course your sins are forgiven and you're cleansed of all unrighteousness. So I think that is, uh, is like if, if we have a portion every Sunday of the program uh, that we do a little gospel message because we assume that there may be somebody listening in the congregation that's not saved. So we always take a little time to tell the good news and explain that to them. I think that's what's happening there. But uh, what do you, uh, what does everyone else think about that? Well, my take on 1 John 1 9 may be just a little bit different than most people's. Uh, Brother Luke, I'm not in disagreement with you. Um, if you look at 1 John 1 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then in verse 10, he addresses, he says, If we say we have not sinned, as Brother Luke was just saying, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So it's the acknowledgement that one is a sinner and the promise that if we confess them, that he is faithful and just in the acknowledgement of that we are sinners, that he will forgive us for all of that sin. And most people stop there and read that. And now they're going to make it an act of contrition. It really starts tying into Catholic dogma and doctrine with what people have turned that into. And it becomes ritualistic. And then people start going in their minds as soon as they think they've sinned or recognize they've sinned. Now I got to hurry up and confess that sin so I can be cleansed again. Okay. But they forgot to continue that this is all one letter and they really should read the whole thing because in chapter two, verse one, it declares really what the meaning of that is. It's laying the foundation and then chapter two, verse one, it says, my little children, these things I write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So people get stuck in this mindset that we have to just continually confess whatever we recognize as sin. And if you do that, you're going to tie up your whole day. You're going to be sin conscious and not sun conscious. What the focus is supposed to be on is that we have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and that he pleads our case with the father. So when the accuser, which is Satan, comes up there and says, hey, Jesus, Father, God, I just saw your son, your daughter do this. The father looks over to Jesus and Jesus says, I paid for that. Mm. I bear the marks for that. I got the stripes on my back for that. Mm. And then the father says, Payment, payment's in full. So I, tell you, I always say the devil's been bald headed for a long time. He pulled his hair out a long time ago because Jesus changed the rules of his game. So we have to remember that we have an advocate. What is an advocate? One who pleads your case for you. In Hebrews, it tells us that Jesus is our high priest. So he's the one that ever living to make intercession on our behalf. I don't worry about sin anymore. I mean, if I recognize that I've done something, I'll deal with that in myself. Uh, I'll do my best to see whatever the pitfalls were that caused me to do it and try to get that straight. I'm not saying don't examine yourself. But what my attitude is towards sin is I wake up in the morning and I say, I thank you, Jesus, that you have paid for all my sin. And I keep on going. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Anybody else want to uh, answer that? I uh, just want to simply quickly say that uh, the debts aren't even paid, so we don't have to go back and keep trying to pay the debt again and again. I mean, yeah, of course, um, as uh, Sister Lisa was saying, you know, you if you do do something that's that's sin, um, you know, the beauty of it is is with the the renewing of our mind, we recognize that. I'm speaking for myself when I do something, I sin against God or. 
um, a brother or sister comes to me and says, you, you know, you hurt my feelings, even in that, uh, that sort of situation, I will, of course, uh, repent, just meaning change of mind. And I'll, I'll say, God, you know, I sure messed up there. Um, help me to do better next time. But the sin itself has already been forgiven. The debt's already been paid. We don't, we don't have to keep going back over and over and over again, at least as it pertains to salvation and do it again and again. And, the, and look, how many times have you been to church service when they're, they're uh, asking people to rededicate their lives and, and, and come down the, to the altar again over and over and over and over again? It's, it, it's like it's never finished. Either we believe that uh, Christ actually finished the work or we don't. If he finished it on the cross and that's it, then um, we only need to, to do it once. We don't have to keep going back over and over. Yeah, yeah, amen. Um, there, there are some that uh, will argue that um, this is necessary because when we sin, we lose fellowship with the Father, and it's necessary to confess it so that you can regain fellowship. And I don't agree with that. Mm -mm. Um, I don't like want to argue with anybody about it, but uh, I, I've had some friends that strongly take that position. But I don't see how I can ever lose fellowship because the Holy Spirit lives in me. He's <laughs> never going to leave me or forsake me. I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit. How could the, if I sin, the Holy Spirit's going to like turn his back on me? Uh, and, the, and, the, and the story that's called the parable of the prodigal son, um, this this guy goes off and gets into sin, but he doesn't he doesn't uh, lose his standing as the man's son. His identity as the man's son doesn't change, and the father, while the son is off in the pig's pen, the father is always waiting with open arms. So the only loss of fellowship is because the son has turned his back on the father, but the father has never turned his back on the son. Angry, and hope full his arms out. Ah. He better come back on bended knee to me, you know. No, so uh, I just don't see that that's something that we uh, we need to do as a religion. I would agree. If I'm if I've got a hold of a bird in my hand, and I've got my my uh, fingers wrapped around it, and uh, I've got a hold of it, and it can't fly away. I mean, his word says that no nothing, no one, nobody can take him out of his hand. So that means us. We can't. We can't take ourselves out. We can't escape his grasp. I mean, once once we're once we've accepted the the free gift, then then that's it. Mm -hmm. Brother Luke, uh -huh. are there any English scholars on the panel or any English experts? Uh, I, I am a certified grammar Nazi. Okay, good. Grammar Nazi. Because I'm about to upset your apple cart. <laughs> this is not going to be good grammar, but it's going to get my point across. It's already done, been, did. <laughs> Period. If I and people know, keep wondering. Did I, did I hurt you, sister? Paula, do I need to apologize? Do I need to repent? You need to repent, yeah. <laughs> it's already done, been, did, y'all. And I'm going to add y'all to it on that one because Jesus did it all. And see, when you learn, when the Bible talks about in Hebrews, and I encourage y'all to read Hebrews and meditate on Hebrews because Hebrews rips this stuff up where it says, There remaineth now therefore a rest for the people of God. Let us therefore labor to enter into the rest. That's what we're doing tonight with this discovery about what these things mean. And as one of the ladies in the chat was asking about this is how we got on this topic. We are laboring right now to enter into the rest. Now, most of us, um, beloved, thank God, we've entered into that rest. But when we see a sister or a brother struggling, we're supposed to help them come to the understanding that it's all of Jesus. They can relax. They can rest assured that they are on a firm foundation in Christ. Ooh. They are planted on better than the rock of Gibraltar. They are on the rock named King Jesus and he cannot fail. You are good. You you are all right. You have been reconciled to God. He is not 
angry at you in any way, shape, or form. He loves you. He loves you so much. He sent his only begotten son to be crucified, suffer a horrible death as the payment for your sin so you could spend eternity with him. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes, honest. Amen. Yeah, amen. Amen. All right. Uh, okay. If there's more questions, put them in caps, so all caps, so we know it. But the next uh, truism is God. This is another one from Daniel. God does not accept your failed attempts at keeping the law. <laughs> <laughs> Gets back to what I was saying earlier. People think think they actually think they're keeping the law, but it's easy legalism. It's cheap law because they water it down and dilute the law so much that they could they could claim they're keeping it. Yep. God's not accepting your failed attempts at keeping the law. No. Nope. Anybody want to talk more about that? Um, I think it's actually insulting. Yeah. You know, when we try to do something that he's already done, it's it's like you know, if someone like just like a the the classic joke about kids getting a Christmas present in an ice big box, and then they want the they play in the box, you know, yeah. that, that wasn't the point. Yeah, not the point yeah. at all, right? Yeah. Uh, Sister Paula V, you were going to say something. Um, yeah, I was going to say that. Uh, say the say the quote again. God does not accept your failed attempts at keeping the law. Right. I think um, this is what tripped up uh, the Jews as well. Um, they they couldn't, you know, they 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 didn't understand that the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. Um, and I think what we have is a lot of carnal people trying to get salvation um, because in the natural world, you do something and you get something. It's a cause and effect. But we have people like grasping at salvation. And I heard um, a preacher say this once. He was talking about um, in the Japanese culture, the proper way to receive a gift is not to grab it with one hand. That's considered rude. The proper way is have both hands open and you bow as you humbly receive it. Mm. And that's how you receive salvation because it is a free gift it's a gift of god and you have to understand that in order to receive it and we have people grasping at it trying to do whatever they can to get it um mm. and that's what they don't understand it's free mm. you receive it there's a difference mm, I like that mm -hmm. yeah awesome yeah uh yeah, it's people are actually deluded. I really have come to that conclusion. When I see all these people coming, uh, especially a lot of the people that are, come on Matthias's program and they're talking and I see, wow, they actually believe that they're that good. They really, really, they, they, they've watered down the law so much that they can actually pretend. They really think that they, they're really following it all. And it's a delusion. Yeah. And it's uh, it, it's just amazing to me how uh, they they just cannot see that the what's demanded is perfection, and uh, they think that they're following it perfectly. Or, well, as long as I'm doing the best I can, I'm trying. Well, that's not the standard. You're trying. You're dying. Yeah, Paul. Paul yeah, says right. that if Paul says if if you want to be under the system of the law, then you're putting yourself under the curse. Yep. And that is that it, it, if you go to the law, it has to be a hundred percent perfect. Yep. And then it's it's cursed because that's doomed to failure. No one's been able to do it except nope. Jesus. Nope. Yeah, and then of course uh, James said that. Uh, uh, if you follow the whole law, yet offend in one point, you're guilty of all. Well, do they just ignore these verses? Oh, Brother Luke, that's easy believism. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Amen. Praise and God. It, it's not easy for them, though, is it? <laughs> they can't believe no, it's not. Trust Jesus. Okay, the next one is everyone has faith, but not everyone has faith that counts. And that was from Matthias. Everyone has faith, 
but not everyone has faith that counts. Mm. It's actually Daniel too. Oh, okay. Uh, well, one of you had to originate it, right? Unless you have a Vulcan mind meld and your minds were connected at the same moment. Right, right. No, no. I'm just saying that that's, that's actually, that's one that I've heard Daniel say since I've met him. Mm -hmm. So I'll use it occasionally, but oh, yeah. So that, it was originally from Daniel? I learned it from Daniel, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, Daniel's a very good person to, to learn from. Everyone has faith, but not everyone has faith that counts. I've often, I've never said it exactly like that, but I've made that point many times that, uh, yeah, you have faith, but your faith is really in yourself. <laughs> you know, your faith is in a religion, a system. Uh, your, your faith is in your ability to, to uh, you know, do what you think is needed so God will approve of you. So your faith is not in the person and the finished work and the promises of Jesus. So, all right, everyone has faith, but not everyone has faith that counts. So what do you, does everybody say about that? I guess it goes under the idea that everybody believes in something, right? Even if you're, if you say you're an atheist, then I guess technically you believe in nothing or you say you believe in nothing, but you all believe in something. So if all of us have some form of faith, we believe in something, but uh, it isn't always the, the right faith. Yeah. 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 Just trying to understand it. I haven't heard that one either. Okay. Uh, the next one is um, the gospel is not how we live our life for him, but how he gave you his life for us. Mm. Oh, that's very profound. How about uh, Sister Paula V? What do you have to say about that? I'm sorry, could you repeat the, the statement again? Yes, yeah, so I'll post it too. It says, the gospel is not how we live our life for him, but how he gave his life for us. Um, right, because uh, I, again, that's just the natural man. Um, like Cain earlier when you guys were talking, I was thinking about Cain. When I first read the Bible, I didn't understand why Cain's gift wasn't accepted by God. I was like, well, he's a farmer. He's yeah. bringing you the best of what he did. Yeah. Like, and Abel was a shepherd. Like, you know, I mean, how, how is that fair? But later when I read it again, I realized that Cain knew what was acceptable to God. Yeah. And he brought the fruit of his hands because, yep. you know, he said, well, what's, you know, this is my, I did this. Like, aren't you impressed? Yeah. And he just didn't, I, he get, I guess he didn't understand that. No, God's not impressed with what you have. What you have is not sufficient. Your righteousness is your good. That that's the good stuff that you do that they're as filthy rags. Yep. Um, only God is good. There's no good thing in, in me at all. Anything good that comes out of me is God. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And there's been some good songs that can kind of uh, come up with clever lyrics, making this kind of a point. It's, it's not who I am. It's what he's done. It's not what I do. It's who he is. Something. I think there's a contemporary Christian song like, like that. And, uh, yeah, but this isn't this really the whole problem uh, the the world believes that uh, our eternity, the afterlife, if I'm going to be like speak like a secular, more secular person, if there is if there is a afterlife, uh, you know, having it work out in your favor, it'll just it's just based upon, you know, if you've done well, if you do well, live a good life, it's going to be good for you. So it's all based upon the merit system, personal merit. And of course, this is, it's, uh, uh, it's not how we live our life. Now, obviously, I want to live a life that's pleasing to God. But um, everything we do before we're, we're uh, regenerated, uh, the... It counts for nothing. No matter how, uh, you could be the most generous uh, philanthropist, kindest person, and uh, you get no credit for that. Uh, uh, 
uh, be, because it's all filthy rags according to the Bible. So, but once we once we um, believed on Jesus, now our life does matter. Uh, if, if we do good things, we will be rewarded for it. Mm -hmm. If we don't, we'll have regrets thinking that, you know, of, of what we could have accomplished. And we were told by Jesus to build up our treasures in heaven and Paul talked about it too. So they are urging us on to do good works. It says that we should do them. And Ephesians 2.10 uh, is we should be doing these things, but salvation is not determined by that. It's just our re the reward system. So the thing is, salvation is not a merit system. It's a, it's a, it's not earned. It's, it's a gift. But, but after that, in eternity, our, our reward, it is based on a reward system. So, um, some people uh, have said that, uh, they, um, they, they think they're doing a lot of work and they're relying on it. And I say, well, show me your resume. Uh, let me tell me what the works you did today for, for Jesus. What did you do yesterday and the day before? And guess what? There's no nothing on their resume. They love they, it. They're, they're so deluded and full of themselves, and they're doing absolutely nothing or very little. It's pitiful what they're doing. And they're the ones that are bragging that works are required and thinking that they're working. Um, and, and yet we are busy doing works, but our works are not really work because it's a labor of love. I'm not doing this because, oh gosh, I've got to really struggle through this. But this is serving the Lord, trying to tell people about the Bible and answer their questions and, and talking about Jesus, not only with believers, but maybe there's non-believers. So these are works and we will be getting rewards for them. But uh, we're not, uh, so it does, it does matter. I forgot what the first the thing was. Now the gospel is not how we live our life for him, but how he gave his life for us. And who else wants to comment on that? Okay, I'll go to the next one then. Uh, the gospel is not a message to continue in sin. It is an offering to rest in his promise. Hmm. That's a little complex. I mean, I think we all understand it, but it's not as simple. I, I like things that are really simple and that people get it immediately. Uh, rest in his promise. Yeah, that's all we have to do. So he's done the work already. He's committed the, committed the work on the cross, uh, the things that were necessary to reconcile us to the Father uh, through him. He, he's, he's done it. It's done. He said it was finished. We believe it's finished. Um, so we can rest in that. We don't have to labor to try to get it because that doesn't work anyway. Um, I don't know if it has to be complex. I think I think uh, that's that's pretty understandable. Well, uh, we did one uh, last week that was uh, one of my favorites, and that is um, from Brother Ronnie. He he originated this saying. And you know, people how they like to say that we're teaching people have a license to sin. Mm -hmm. And Ronnie says, no, we're saying we have a license to rest. Yes. Oh, a license to rest. And that's kind of what th this is saying here. Yeah. Gospel well, is not a message to continue in sin. No, we're not saying you have a license to sin. Just go in the head and sin all you want. We're saying if you do want to sin, Sin brings its own penalties with it. You're not going to get away with your sins uh, in this life, but they are forgiven for eternity. But uh, it is, uh, the gospel is a, an offer to you, a, a, an urge. We're, we're really urged, to rest in Jesus. Don't worry. Just That's what we are talking about, I think, before we started the program, is being able to not worry about things. Yeah. Well, Brother Luke, though, the fall was the license to sin. They twisted it all around. The gospel is the message that King Jesus has paid it all for us. And he has reconciled us unto God. It's not in any way a license to sin. It is actually the spirit of adoption, as the Bible says, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yes. Amen. 
Uh, okay, you ready for the very last one on the list? Yep. The gospel is not a commandment to do. It is a message to trust. Don't everybody shout out at once. Could you repeat that, Brother Lou? Yes. The gospel is not a commandment to do. It is a message to trust. Some of the, by the way, I arranged these in a particular order because I thought the strongest ones I put at the beginning. And as they got a little more complex and a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, hard to understand that in other words if a person should read it and instantly get it but this one says the gospel is not a commandment to do uh, so we say uh the, the one we said last time just to compare this is the uh the gospel is not do uh the, it, no no this it says religion says do but jesus says done that's simple that's short simple but profound Okay, this is the last one. The gospel is not a commandment to do, it's a message to trust. How about uh, Sister Lisa? Yeah, Brother Luke. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking about what you were saying. The gospel is not a commandment to do. It is a revelation of what's been done. And it is the preaching of what's been done because the gospel is good news. You know, when people talk about hell, hell is a biblical doctrine, but it's not good news. No. So when we run around preaching, and, and I heard the late Dr. Curtis Hudson say this, he said, he said that um, when we're preaching and we preach biblical truths, they may be factual, they may be actual, but they're not necessarily the gospel. The gospel is only one message. What great things Christ has done for us to reconcile us unto himself, that the, the payment, the ransom has been made in full and we are restored by our faith and trust in him to right relationship with God. Mm. You, know, you know, this. these messages are all, in fact, most of the questions that you've asked, when, we ask, when we're answering them, we've pretty much covered them already because the gospel is a redundant message. All you can do is keep going back to the cross, what Jesus did, what he paid, payment in full to tell us die, good news. We get to enter heaven now. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. The, um, many years ago, I, w I was street preaching and a young man wanted to be a street preacher and kind of wanted me to disciple him and help him. And he was out there preaching with me and I, I, he started preaching and I had to say, look, uh, do you want to be an evangelist or do you want to be a pastor? I said, he said, well, what do you mean? I said, you're, you're teaching them all kinds of Bible theology about all kinds of stuff that's, that, that's not part of the gospel. I said, if that's what you want to do, you need to become a, a pastor and, and get over a congregation and teach them everything in the Bible. But if you want to be an evangelist, it's a very short, simple message, and it, and it is redundant. It is, we just repeat this short message over and over and over again. Not everybody is suited to it because maybe you can get bored just saying the same little message over and over and over again. And uh, if it's, if it's uh, too boring for you, then, then don't be an evangelist because we don't want to uh, and what he was doing, by the way, I'll confess, I did the same thing when I started. When I first started street preaching, I wanted to do a really good job. So I prepared a, a sermon for the, and uh, it was 90 minutes long, typed out 20 pages. I memorized every word of it. I could say that 90 minutes word for word over and over again. But what I realized is that as I'm doing that sermon, the street preachers, were just so impressed with me. <laughs> I was a big hit. I mean, I was so impressive. And yet, I'm, after I, once I realized that, wait a second, uh, I'm, I'm not here to please them. I'm supposed to be telling them this simple message, and yet I'm trying to impress the crowd with all my theological knowledge. Yeah. 
We're so egotistical. And uh, so we need to just, yeah, right, Lisa. This is just a very short, simple message, this gospel. And it's, it's redundant. But if we're going to be evangelists, uh, then uh, we have to be content that it's, it's just a, it's probably only like, uh, you know, a tenth of 1% of the Bible. But it's the, it's the one thing, the, the person and finished work and promises of Jesus is, is that that's the, the one thing you better get right. If you could be, I keep saying, you could be wrong about everything else in the Bible. Well, this is where people hate me. There are a lot of people that are very dogmatic and they're saying, no, there's much more than that. These three core doctrines, that's not enough. There's, you, you know, that, that you've got to get a lot of other things right. So what they're doing is they have five dogmas, 10 dogmas, 20 dogmas, where they think everything, all these other things are also rise to this certain same level of importance. But I believe you can be wrong about everything. I don't want to be wrong. I've been wrong. I've been corrected. I've changed my mind. I'm trying to get it all right. But as long as we get who is Jesus, how do I get saved right? Then we're in good standing. Well, yeah, when I say redundancy, too, I'm not saying that in any way as an indictment. It's necessarily redundant because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And people, you know, need to hear the gospel message a number of times to let that resonate so they can meditate on it. Because remember, you're dealing with a carnal mind. They have it. Their their mind is at enmity with God. It is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. So it needs to keep hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing the gospel. And then one day, they the light bulb goes on, and they can see God. They can see the plan of salvation, and then they receive it. So it's okay that the message is redundant. I, I just wanted to be clear on that. It's not a bad thing that it's redundant when it's yeah. when it's accurate and when it's correct. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's got to be short and simple, so so easy to understand that a little child could understand it. Uh, we want to complicate things. And uh, yeah. All right. Um, let I think um, anybody want to say more on that before we uh, start closing up the program for the night here? No. Okay. Then. Um, let me ask each person to uh, take a minute or so and uh, make any final remarks you want to make regarding the anything that was said tonight or, or the and the fellowship. And if you're in the chat room here, uh, if you make a statement in all caps or a question that you want us to respond to quickly, just we'll go ahead and look for that. And start here with uh, uh, Sister Paula, Bible literalist. Uh, give me your, your summary thoughts, please. I think all of the truisms have the same message really is it's about humility because you can't, if you have to work for it, then you get credit. And yeah. that's what is unique about our faith. It is not an ego booster. It, you have to humble yourself because you can't do anything. And that means it's not about you. And that's why when people bring in Lordship Salvation or You've got to have enough faith or whatever it is that they're saying you have to do something. And so it's about you then. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Amen. Uh, so sola gloria de Dios. So all the glory for God. No, nope. that's the problem is people will not let God have all the glory. They want to keep some glory from themselves. They claiming that they did some, con made some contribution to their salvation. Uh, Sister Paula, I don't think you're finished. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. That's really all I had to say. <laughs> all right. Okay. Th thank you for being with us tonight. And the next up is Brother Cripps. Yeah, I loved it. I, I really enjoyed this uh, fellowship, and I think we hit on some uh, important things. Um, I like uh, the truisms, and I, I did listen to last week, even though I wasn't here. Uh, I listened to it after the fact, and... Um, uh, this was good, man. I like I like this. It's uh, simple, and um, I like everyone's answers. It's uh, awfully nice, especially when the answers are so similar. We don't seem to uh, disagree on the uh, fundamentals of these things. Uh, so I enjoyed it. I uh, appreciate you letting me be a part of it. Yes. All right. Thank you, brother. We appreciate you being with us. 
And uh, Sister Lisa, your summary. Yeah, I think it's been awesome. You know, I love that um, when we come together, you know, we're speaking about things that can encourage one another in the faith and dispel myths, rumors, lies, you know, falsities against the word of God or in people's misconceptions about the word of God so that we can help one another grow in grace, help our brothers or sisters that are struggling, that have real questions about real things that they may be uncomfortable coming face to face to a pastor to ask because they don't want to be judged and yeah. they can do so in this chat room and nobody knows who they are, you know, necessarily. We don't know that any of these names are necessarily accurate. Doesn't make them evil if they're using a moniker. Doesn't make them better if they're using their real name, but they can ask a question and not be judged for it. And I think that's a beautiful thing because a lot of times people don't get that assistance in church because they're afraid that now, you know, a secret is out about them or something along those lines where they feel like they can't hold their head and walk into the sanctuary again, which is ridiculous. That's supposed to be the place you you can come for comfort, understanding and support. And yet too often these churches are places that run people away and don't and don't encourage relationship with Christ. And it's sad, but I'm glad that we can do that here. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yep. Uh, okay, Sister, Sister Paula V. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed the truisms. Um, and there was uh, one thought I had uh, to leave with. Um, you know, when I first read the Bible, it's easy to see why people think you have to do stuff because there's a lot of commandments in there. There's a lot of things that Jesus mm -hmm has told us to do. And that's something I didn't understand. I got frustrated one day and I said, how can I, how am I supposed to rest in you when you're telling me to do all this stuff? And a lot of this stuff I can't even do. I don't think I would ever be able to turn the other cheek if someone hit me. I'd hit him back probably. Uh, and I'm supposed to love my enemy. How am I supposed to do that? And he had to show me that you can't, you can't do that. The fruit that's born on us is his fruit. We're just a branch. We have no power within ourselves to produce the fruit. A branch doesn't know how to do that. If you cut a branch off the vine, it's never going to bring you a piece of fruit. Nope. It has to stay in the vine because it's the vine who's bringing forth the fruit and we just bear it. Mm -hmm. And that's what he had to show me, um, that all the stuff that he has us to do is actually him doing it through us if we will rest in him and his finished work and what he does amen that's why the whole idea of fruit inspectors is just so silly to me where's your fruit it's like it's not even my fruit yeah okay thank you thank you sister i'm very happy that you were able to be with us tonight uh, I see there is a question from Richard or Rena. I'll, I'll answer it quickly. Maybe if anybody wants to answer it, you can, but I can give you a short answer. Um, if the dead know nothing, how does absent from the body present with the Lord make any sense? Uh, well, if you, you might already be aware of this, Richard, that um, my position uh, on the, the, the state of the dead is that when we die, we do have consciousness yeah. uh, whether we are lost or saved we are not uh, as some would teach soul sleep or completely dead body soul and spirit and and uh, uh and uh, not aware of anything but i think we do have this consciousness uh but the the people who uh argue in uh soul sleep their answer to this verse is how does absent from the body present with the lord making sense they would say because I've, I've i've studied this with people who disagree with me on this and they say absent from the body present with the lord as far as you know that's their answer in other words if i die right now uh i believe i'm present with the lord immediately and i'm conscious and i'm aware of it 
uh, they would argue that no, you're not conscious, you're not aware of anything. Maybe a thousand years will pass and you, you're not aware of time passing because you don't exist. You're either soul sleep or you just don't exist. And then there's a resurrection. And when you're resurrected, whether you're with the Lord, you, you're as far as you know, no time has passed. So that's why they would say absent from the body is present with the Lord as far as you know. In other words, you're not aware of the time that's passed. That's how they would argue it, but they're they're not right. I don't believe in soul sleep or the unconscious state of the dead. I do believe, though, in the um, the, the 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 lost uh, do uh, uh, suffer the second death and perish. They don't. They're not tormented. So, in that respect, I'm. I'm on that part of the issue, but not on the issue of the, the, the lost or we're unconscious or unaware until the resurrection. <clears throat> okay, does anybody else want to say anything on that? I try to get it, but you can go to my playlist, what is the state of the dead? And you can see about f five or six hours on that if you want. Okay, anybody, anybody else? No. Okay, then thank you everybody for being, uh, uh, with us tonight uh, and I look forward to, to next Friday night they're a lot of fun and uh, I will uh, also ask you to join us on Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern for the Church of the Eternally Secure Sunday service and join us also Wednesday night Bible study 9 30 Eastern time thank you everybody bless you all in the name of our great Savior God Jesus <laughs>